Imagine a tic-tac-toe grid, i.e. a square that is subdivided into 3x3 three three equals 9 smaller squares in which you can play a game. If you look at it straight, it looks like this. If you look at it from an angle, it gets perspectively distorted. This also happens when you take a photo of it or when you make a drawing. Now, imagine in such a drawing you only have the outline given. How can you construct the rest of the grid? And in particular, can you do it in a way that generalizes to other subdivisions like 4x4 or 5x5? I'm Bernhard Werner and this is an introduction to projective geometry via tic-tac-toe grids. Projective geometry is a field of mathematics that is interested in how various concepts from Euclidean geometry can be generalized. Euclidean geometry is the type of geometry you learn in school. Points, lines, distances, angles, circles, etc. But distances, for example, do not get preserved under perspective distortions. We can see that with the image of the tic-tac-toe grid. Originally, the inner lines have a uniform distance to each other, a third of the square length. In the perspective drawing, the parts which are closer to the observer appear larger than the ones farther away. In projective geometry, we want to find out how exactly these differences arise and can be described. Before we continue, a disclaimer. I will use the example of the tic-tac-toe grid as motivation to talk about math. In particular, most constructions I will show you are more complicated than they need to be. In practice, if you wanted to draw such grids, there are surely more efficient ways to do so. And a proper artist might be able to tell you how they work. Here, however, I will mostly concern myself with the math. First, we have to clarify what you mean by a perspective drawing or a perspective distortion. We define them as functions that map every point in the plane to another point in the plane such that when points are together on a line beforehand, they are still together on a line afterwards. And second, the process can be reversed. We call functions that do this projective transformations. The first condition says that straight lines are the underlying structure we want to be preserved. Other things might behave differently, like circles which get mapped to ellipses. But straight lines should stay straight. The second condition makes sure that we don't accidentally collapse everything onto a single straight line. In other words, if we have a perspective drawing of a thing, we should be able to reconstruct the original thing from it. But here we run into a problem. If we have a perspective drawing of a grid, we can extend the grid lines and the parallel ones will eventually meet at a point. It is often called the vanishing point of these lines. You probably have seen this phenomenon in photos of rail tracks, facades of buildings or floor tiles. In art class, you might have learned that these vanishing points of parallel lines always sit on the horizon. Theoretically, they should be slightly above the horizon to account for the curvature of the Earth, but it's still an excellent visual model. In any way, they all lie together on a line, which we call the line at infinity. If you draw more bundles of transformed parallel lines, you can see this line more clearly. The issue with these vanishing points now is that we can see them and work with them after projective transformation. In particular, they are points on a line which also has many other points on it. According to our two criteria for what a projective transformation is, they have to exist even before we apply the transformation to our nice regular grid. We can fix this by just imagining that they are there only infinitely far away in the direction of the corresponding lines. Seriously, that's it. We can make it a bit more precise, of course, but in the end we simply add all points in which parallel lines meet at some sort of virtual points to our Euclidean plane and do geometry with them as if they were regular points. And the infinitely far away part hopefully makes sense after comparing the Euclidean and the perspective drawings. With that settled for now, we can start to look at a few constructions. For example, we can construct the center of the square by intersecting its diagonals, something we can easily translate to the perspective case. If we wanted to cut the square vertically in half, we would draw a line through the center, which is parallel to the two vertical sides. In the perspective drawing, we can do that too. All we have to do is replace the notion of parallel line with a line through the same vanishing point. And we get the vanishing points by extending and intersecting the former parallel side of the square. That is the core principle you need to know about perspective constructions. First, whenever you intersect straight lines or connect points in the Euclidean case, you can do that in the perspective case too. Second, 
If you have parallels in the Euclidean case, you carry them over as lines through appropriate vanishing points. Now, to finally get back to our original goal of subdividing the square into 3 by 3 smaller ones, we carry on from this cutting in half construction. We can look at the points where the last line intersects the horizontal sides. It does so, of course, at the midpoint of each side. We can connect these midpoints to the opposite corners of the square. The lines intersect the diagonals in two new points in the inside. I now claim that if we draw lines through these new points, which are parallel to the sides of the square, we get the 3 by 3 subdivision we are looking for. Before I explain why that's correct, let us quickly look at the perspective version of that. We connect the perspective middle point on the top and the bottom side with opposite corners and intersect these new lines with the diagonals. Now we want lines through these points that are parallel to the sides, i.e. in the perspective case we draw lines through these points and the two vanishing points we have. And so we get the perspectively correct subdivision we wanted. To prove that this is actually correct, we can look solely at the Euclidean case, since we only use points and lines in a way that is compatible with projected transformations. So, to prove the Euclidean construction, we choose a coordinate system that has its origin at the bottom left corner of the square and the one zero point in the bottom right. With this, two of the lines we are intersecting can be described with the equations y equals 2x and y equals 1 minus x, respectively. Then, it's relatively easy to show that these two lines intersect at x equals 1 over 3, and I'll leave that as a homework for you. Speaking of homework, with this proof in mind, can you see a way to directly iterate this construction to get a 4x4 subdivision of the square and moreover 5x5, 6x6 and so on? Now I want to talk to you about how we can more or less directly measure things in projective geometry. If we look at a perspective drawing of the tic-tac-toe grid, we see that the sides of the grid cells all have different lengths. Let's try to describe how that happens. Let's look at a line segment in the plane with equally spaced points on it. If you rotate or translate the plane, the distances between the points on the line stay the same. In mathematics, we say that the distances are invariant under these transformations. When we throw shearing or scaling into the mix, the distances might change. Only the ratios stay invariant. And if we have a general projective transformation, not even that stays the same. But the ratio of the ratio of the distances is invariant. Let us make that a bit more precise. For any line that we look at, we choose an orientation. Then, for two points PQ on the line, we define their assigned distance, SDPQ, to be their normal distance, but positive if the vector from P to Q points the same way as the line itself, and negative if it points the other way. Given four points A, B, C, D on a line, we can define their so-called cross ratio as a ratio of ratios of four sine distances, from A to C and D, and from B to C and D. But we usually write it in a slightly nicer way by resolving the double fractions. Now, I claim that the cross ratio stays the same under projective transformations. Instead of a proper proof, however, I want to show you a little experiment you can do on your own to test this hypothesis. And it will also serve as an example to see how sine distances work. Take a straight measuring device like a ruler, measuring tape or yardstick. Choose four points on it and measure the assigned distances. Here in my case, I took the points 0, 5, 15 and 40 on my ruler. The units aren't relevant since they cancel anyway, but here they were centimeters. And I chose the ordinary direction of the ruler as our measuring direction. Now we can compute the cross ratio of these four points. Note that the sine distances just turn into differences, since we have very explicit coordinates on our ruler. After you have done the same with your points, take a photo of them. Then measure the distances on the photo and compute a new cross ratio for them. To measure the distances, you can use a ruler that you place on the screen, a photo editing software with which you can count pixels or anything else, it doesn't matter. I will use the image already up on the screen and throw it into the dynamic geometry software Cinderella. After marking the points as precisely as possible, I use Cinderella's measuring tool and get the distances. The cross ratio we get from them is then 1.3114 
and ignoring measuring inconsistencies, we see that it's the same as before. If you do this experiment, I encourage you to take photos from various angles and directions and check that it's always the same cross ratio. For completeness, Cinderella has a cross ratio function built in, so we can double check that our example here works. Hopefully, after you've done this experiment yourself, you are convinced that the cross ratio works as advertised. Now, if you choose three fixed points on a line and let the fourth one wander, you will get every real number as a cross ratio exactly once, and even infinity when the denominator becomes zero. That means if we have three points on a line, the resulting cross ratio uniquely determines any fourth point. Going back to our perspective tic-tac-toe grid, let's look at the bottom edge. If we had three given points, we could reconstruct any other point we wanted from the cross ratio. But in the perspective case, we only have two points, the corners of the square. However, we also have the vanishing point. So let's start on the Euclidean side. We choose the orientation of the line to go to the right, and we assume that the left corner of the square sits at coordinate 0, while the right sits at 1. That means we are searching for the points at coordinates 1 third and 2 thirds. For now, let's just focus on the one at 2 thirds. The vanishing point is infinitely far away in the Euclidean case, so it gets coordinate infinity. We now would like to compute the cross ratio 0, 1, infinity, 2 thirds. But we don't know yet how to deal with the calculation when infinity is involved. But instead of spending another 10 minutes going into the fine details of why it works that way, I will only tell you. For any point P, its sine distance to the vanishing point, SDP infinity, is 1, if measured in the direction of the line, and minus 1, measured in the opposite direction. Note that every line has only one vanishing point, so we imagine it to sit at both quote-unquote ends of the infinitely long line. Moreover, this convention for distances only makes sense for computing cross ratios, not in general. Back to the square again. We can now compute the cross ratio 0, 1, infinity, 2 thirds to be minus 1 half. That means if we look at the projective transformation of the square, we know that the transformed points must have the same cross ratio as the one we just computed. So we can pinpoint the location of the transformed point 2 thirds with a ruler by finding the point with this particular cross ratio. Afterwards, we could do this for all points on all sides and complete the subdivision we are looking for. This is nice, we can measure things in perspective drawings, albeit with a slightly complicated process. However, it would be even nicer if we could explicitly construct points with a given cross ratio. With only three starting points, however, this is not possible, at least when we limit ourselves to using a straight edge. But there is one cross ratio that is constructible with straight lines, it's relatively easy, and we have seen the construction already in this video. Consider a line where we have the points 0, 1, infinity, and 1 half. Calculating the cross ratio gives us minus 1. But we can also construct the point 1 half explicitly as the projective middle point of 0 and 1. To do so, we imagine a square above the line and split it in half, as we have already seen a while ago. So, when we have three points on a line, of which one is the vanishing point, we can construct a fourth point on it with cross ratio minus one. What's even handier is that we can use the same construction and flip it around, since two infinity one zero is also equal to minus one. This allows us to construct a point two from zero and one. That means we can take a piece of a line and add it to itself while respecting the perspective change in length. As long as we have enough other points, we can both split a segment in half or double it. We can even apply this last construction over and over again to build a whole projective ruler. With a bit of care, we can even recycle most of the existing auxiliary construction. As another homework, rewind the last few seconds and really look for the perspectively drawn rectangles that were split in half when I constructed the points 3, 4, and 5. All under the assumption, of course, that we also know where the vanishing point is. When four points have cross ratio minus 1, we say that they are in harmonic position. It is a very special configuration of four points, not only because it's one of few that can be constructed, but there are plenty of theorems on projective geometry that can be derived from this. Now, this would be more than enough to draw a grid if we started with the small grid cells and just wanted to duplicate them. 
but in our original problem, we only have the outer points of the tic-tac-toe grid given and want to find the inner ones. Here is how you could approach this with harmonic point constructions directly. First, we use 2 infinity 1 0 equals minus 1 to get the point with coordinate 2, which lies outside the square. But now we use 0 1 2 2 thirds equals minus 1 to get the 2 thirds point on the inside we are looking for. And this is a bit weird. The way we introduced the cross ratio of minus 1 was to assume that one point is the vanishing point of the line. Then the other three are equally spaced in the projected world. But previously we already said that for any given three points we can find a fourth one with any given cross ratio. So we will never know when and where this constructible cross ratio of minus one might pop up when the vanishing point is not involved. And that's why I don't like this method very much. It's straightforward to verify that the cross ratio of 0, 1, 2, 2 thirds is actually minus 1. But it's not immediately clear how to even look for this variant. So, even if you were content with the solution for finding points of the subdivisions into three parts, it is absolutely not obvious how to find it, and neither how to generalize it to other subdivisions into four, five, or more parts. But with the standard interpretation of harmonic points, if we actually do use the vanishing point, we can do my favorite solution to the problem. Let's look at a line segment in the Euclidean plane again. In school, maybe 8th grade or so, I learned the following method to subdivide it into any number of equal pieces. Maybe you have seen it too. First, we draw an auxiliary line at an angle, starting at one of the endpoints. Then we draw some equally spaced points on it, usually with a compass. We connect the last one with the other endpoint of our base segment. Lastly, we draw lines parallel to the last one through the markings on the auxiliary line. Where they intersect the baseline, there are the equidistant subdivisions. And the best part is, we can carry all steps over to the perspective case. Intersecting lines is hopefully clear anyway, and we can handle parallel lines with an appropriate vanishing point. What's left are the equally spaced markings on the auxiliary line we did with a compass. But we saw how to do this with the harmonic points construction, we just got out of the analysis of points with cross ratio minus 1. So we can combine everything we've seen so far and get the following. Take a perspective line where we have three points given, 0, 1 and infinity. Draw an auxiliary line through 0. Then we choose a vanishing point for this line as well as the first segment of length r we want to duplicate. Then we do duplicate it several times with the harmonic point construction, in this case until we have three pieces. We now intend to project them down onto the original line. We start with a line connecting the endpoints just as in the Euclidean case. Next we need to draw parallels to it. Here in the projective case this means to draw lines through its vanishing point of our auxiliary construction. We find it by connecting the vanishing points we already have. We now draw the projective parallels through the other points on the auxiliary line and intersect them with the original line to obtain the desired subdivision. This was very fast and it's a bit messy, so make sure to review the last few steps carefully. Since we're actually interested in subdividing a whole square and not just a single line, we could do the same for one of the vertical sides too. But it's easier to draw some of the diagonals of the grid, which are also parallel to each other. That way, you have to draw much fewer lines overall. The deeper reason why this method here works is that such a central projection from one line to another is a projective transformation itself. And so it keeps the cross ratio invariant between the lines. Because of that, this solution is very easy to generalize. When you need more grid lines inside your square, you can just create more markings on the first auxiliary line. In general, you can transfer any projective scale from one line to another with this approach. So this is more complex, but also more flexible than the first solution we found. The concepts we used here are all fundamental to projective geometry. And depending on which you are familiar with, you can get various constructions out of them to solve any number of problems. Here, to subdivide a square into 3x3 three three equals smaller squares, we saw three different possibilities. First, we saw a solution 
can only use the fact that straight lines stay straight lines even after projective transformation. All we had to take care of were parallel lines, which now intersect in vanishing points. Second, we introduced a cross ratio as a way to measure things. We worked our way to a single cross ratio that we can construct and used it in a rather counterintuitive way to find the subdivision. Lastly, we used all previous ideas to transfer a projective scale from one line to another, a method that is a direct generalization of what we might do in the Euclidean case, in which you might even be familiar with from school. Of course, there are many more ways to do this. For example, one thing I haven't talked about at all are homogeneous coordinates, something you've probably heard of if you have heard anything about projective geometry before this video. They are a way to represent points in 2D by vectors in 3D. And after ironing out a few kinks, you can then write a projective transformation as a matrix vector product. That means you can simply compute where points end up at. This is super important if you're doing computer graphics, but for this video I wanted to stick to constructions you can do with pen and paper. There's much more to say about every single concept I presented here, of course, but hopefully you found this overview of ideas in projective geometry up to this point already entertaining and or interesting. Bye.